Hi, this is Chaplain Greg, and uh, welcome back to the Wandering Wesleyan and uh, our Walking in the Word series. We are making our way through the New Testament, and uh, we've talked about two of the Gospels, Matthew and Mark, and we had a sermon last week on uh, Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, and uh, this week we are looking at Dr. Luke. Uh, Luke, who wrote a Gospel and the Book of Acts, which happened sort of like a uh, uh, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, uh, what happened after Jesus ascended into heaven. And so uh, Dr. Luke is going to be our focus today. And, and who was this guy named Luke? Well, he was probably a Gentile, um, probably from Macedonia, which is in northern Greece. Um, he was a physician. We know this from Colossians 4.14. Um, Colossians 4.14 talks about Luke being a, a close companion of Paul and a physician. Now, today, when we go see the doctor, the doctor is an esteemed position in our society. A doctor goes through many, many years of school and lots of hard work and they become a physician. It wasn't so in the ancient world. Physicians or doctors were slaves. All right, so maybe he was a slave. Uh, rich people didn't hang around sick folks. Rich people wouldn't go to somebody who was ill or injured. And no, you sent your slave to that. So there were certain slaves that were trained in medical arts. And they'd send because slaves were expendable, you know. Um, and so a physician was more than often, more often than not, a slave. So it's very possible that Luke could have himself was a slave. He was a companion of Paul, a very close companion of Paul. Uh, the book of Acts, which is an explanation of what happened after Jesus' uh, ascension into heaven. Luke writes in the first person in many parts of Acts. So from chapter 16, verse 10, through chapter uh, through verse 17, and then chapter 20, verses 5, through chapter 21, verse 18, and then again in chapter 27, uh, really through the end of the book, he's writing from his own, his own experiences and his being with Paul. Um, he's mentioned as the only person with Paul while he was in prison in Rome, and that's in 2 Timothy 4.11. Um, so the, Luke's gospel, like I said, he, he has two books. So Luke Part one is his gospel. So the first two chapters of Luke are really important. Um, it's attributed to Luke by the early church. So Luke doesn't identify himself in either of these uh, works. But the early church pointed and said, yeah, he's the guy that write, wrote it. It was written probably in the early 60s A.D., uh, Paul was executed in 64. There's no mention of Paul's death in Acts. Um, there's no mention of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD either. And there's no mention of Nero's persecution, which started around 62, 63. So it was really early in the 60s that uh, the Gospel and the Book of Acts were written. Uh, some of the features of Luke. So, when we talk about the Gospels, the, the, the church, uh, the early church and, and through the history of the church have put different symbols to represent the different Gospels. So Mark is the symbol of a man, the realism of Jesus' life. Matthew is a lion uh, writing for the Jews and Jesus was uh, from the tribe of Judah, uh, it, which was symbolized as a lion. John and Eagle, theological gospel. It's to fly higher than the others. Luke, Luke's image is a calf, the sacrifice animal. It focuses very heavily on the sacrifice of Jesus. We notice that in the beginning of both Luke and the book of Acts, he's writing to a fellow by the name of Theophilus. Who is this Theophilus guy? Well, it means lover or friend of God. So Theophilus may have been a patron, somebody who sponsored uh, Luke in his writing, uh, may have been to the church as a whole, those that love God. 
may have been to a Jewish high priest who was the son of Annas until 41 AD. Um, probably not, but there's a guy named Theophilus out there, and he was probably the guy who permitted Saul to persecute the church. So uh, maybe it was him, probably not. I have a feeling that it's probably meant for the whole church, but we don't know. We don't know. It's a careful biography. So the Gospel of Luke is a careful biography, and the Book of Acts is a careful history of the early church. And it starts with the genealogy of Joseph. So Matthew is focused on Mary's lineage. Even though it ends up with Joseph, it really is more of a lineage from Mary because a Jew was only indeed a Jew if they were born from a Jewish mother. Um, but Luke is focusing on Joseph's lineage and uh, that sort of points to his Gentile orientation because the patriarch of the family was really important in the Gentile world. There's an extensive narrative story. So chapters one and two are really, folk, they're long chapters. They're not short chapters. They're long. And it's probably narratives that Luke got from Mary, the mother of Jesus herself. Um, the stories really could have only come from Mary um, so his time with her, he must have interviewed her extensively and gotten these stories from her. Throughout the book of Luke, there is a concern with social outcasts. So the poor, women, those who are considered mm -hmm. sinners. Uh, women especially receive a very high place in Luke's gospel. There is an extensive use of parables throughout Luke's gospel. It's, it's one of the features that he uses parables in a very strong way. So the centerpiece of these parables is in Luke 15, where he has one big parable divided into three parts. So you have the parable of the lost sheep, the one amongst the 100. Uh, you have the parable of the lost coin, which is one of 10. And then the parable of the lost son, also known as the prodigal son, where one out of two is sought after. So I want to read Luke verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. And um, this sort of gets into the heart of why Jesus and Luke used parables. And his disciples asked him, meaning Jesus, what does this parable mean? Uh, Jesus had just told the parable of the sower. So Jesus said, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you to know, but to the rest it is parables, so that they, looking, they may not see, and hearing, they may not understand. So Jesus is using parables in order to communicate kingdom-centered principles. And there are those that are going to get it and those that are not going to get it. Okay? So let's turn to uh, chapter 14, verse 1. And we're going to talk about a particular scene in Luke's gospel in which Jesus is getting to the heart of why the heart matters more than the actions. So starting at verse 1, on Sabbath, one Sabbath, when he went to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. So maybe he had congestive heart failure or something like that, where people swell up um, quite a bit because the heart isn't working correctly. In response, Jesus asked the law experts. It's also something that a physician would notice too, right? Yeah. So in response, Jesus asked the law experts and the physicians, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. So the scribes and the Pharisees were not going to answer his question. He took the man, he healed him, and then he sent him on his way. 
And then he said to him, Jesus said this to the scribes and Pharisees, which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could find no answer to these things. Isn't that fascinating? Jesus is sort of turning things around. It's not about the letter of the law. It's not about um, obeying rules one through three correctly. It's about what's in your heart. What's the right thing to do? What is the greater good that is being accomplished here? All right. So I want to read another passage of, of Luke here. And this is in chapter 18. And it's uh, two verses, about three verses, 15 through 17. And it's a blessing of children. So this is the outsiders. These are the others. People. So first of all, he heals somebody who is unclean. This person who is sick is unclean. All right. Uh, then we have the blessing of the children. These are others. Children weren't really considered members of society until they usually reach the age of 13. And Jesus is going to turn that on its head. So people were bringing infants to him so that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Jesus, however, invited them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. This is so important because the kingdom of God is for everybody. Rules, legalism, exclude others. Let's go back to verse to chapter 13. And I want to read verses 18 through 21, because this really does talk about what this whole concept of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is all about. It's a parable of the mustard seed and the leaven. Jesus said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like and what can I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed to his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the sky nested in its branches. Again, he said, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like heaven. It's like leaven that a woman put and took mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. So this kingdom of God that all of us as followers of Jesus are members of, we can't help but affect what's around us if we're truly living that way. If we're truly living the kingdom in the kingdom that God wants us, that Jesus called us to live in, you can't help but affect all that's around us. Through his parables and his actions of healing and deliverance, Jesus demonstrates what happens to people when they encounter this kingdom and that sets him at odds with the religious elite because they cannot tolerate this the crucifixion story involves dialogue with all kinds of people so let me start with luke 23 we're going to go to chapter 23 and verses 32 through 49 it's a, it's a bigger section, but I, I think it's worth uh, contemplating. So Jesus is crucified between two criminals. All right. And Luke's the only one that provides this detail. So he must have got it from one of the folks that were there at the crucifixion. Um, it starts at verse 32. Uh, two other criminals were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the left, one on the right. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. We read that in Psalms, didn't we? Psalm 22? Yeah. The people stood watching and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself. If this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. 
they came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Remember that term rebuke, because rebuke is usually used for the enemy, the Satan, the snaky one. And this criminal used that same language toward this guy who was blaspheming against Jesus. But the other one rebuked him and said, don't you even fear God? Since you are undergoing the same punishment, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, and this is Jesus talking, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Because the sun's light had failed, the curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what had happened, he began to glorify God, saying, This man was righteous. All the crowds had gathered for this spectacle. When they saw what had taken place, they went home, striking their chests. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Did you catch some of the major things there? Jesus, even on the cross, reached out to the other, the person hanging next to him. Truly, today you will be with me in paradise. The splitting of the curtain, the opening of the Holy of Holies, because now the presence of God is for everyone who puts their faith, hope, and trust into Jesus. Jesus starts with forgiveness, even on the cross, even during his crucifixion, the hardest, most painful way to die in those in those times it continues with compassion to the outsider and he releases his spirit back to the father now i'm going to leave you with one more story and this is from the end of the gospel of luke jesus is resurrected and he meets two people on the road to a town called Emmaus, and they don't know who he is. And there are two points to this story, and I, I, I encourage you to read it. It's in chapter 24, uh, verses 13 through 19. I'm sorry, 13 through 35. Two points to this story, and this is where I'll leave you. It highlights how Jesus wasn't understood by those he was with before the Holy Spirit was sent. It also highlights how the Hebrew scriptures all pointed to him, his crucifixion and his resurrection. Because when Jesus left those two disciples, they said, didn't our hearts burn when he was teaching us and he was using the Hebrew scriptures to teach them about who he was and what he had to go through. So that's it for this week. We're going to continue with the book of Acts next week. Uh, so until then, if you like this, please like and subscribe. And uh, send me an email, wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. Um, put some comments in the comment section. I'd love to hear what you're thinking. So until next week, God bless.